Hi, sorry, there was a little bit of a technical glitch there. I think it's over. Uh, it involved a floating two in the middle of the page. Okay, so um, this is a PowerPoint uh, that is uh, under my uh, research related stuff on my home page. And uh, this overview of uh, the PowerPoint is uh, relevant to the quiz. So let's hope no two shows up here. Whoops. Uh, we want to go full screen. Good. Okay, OTC pain relievers. OTC over the counter, uh, that's part of this chapter. Uh, Advil, aspirin, and Tylenol, uh, all three discussed in this chapter. And um, I was exposed to a lot of Sesame Street as my children were growing up. And there was a song, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong, should we care? Um, so for most of the, my career, I studied pain, uh, actually pain inhibition. Uh, my early readings about pain pretty much convinced me that opiates, nowadays everybody calls them opioids, but really opiates, worked in the brain and things like aspirin worked in uh, injured peripheral tissues. Uh, here's a classic piece of research. Uh, I'm not sure we would do this anymore today. So it's called the cro cross perfused spleen preparation for dogs. So uh, both dogs have a spleen. Both spleens are wired to the relevant dog's brain, but the blood for each spleen comes from the other dog. Let me say that again. Both dogs have spleens. Both spleens are wired to the relevant dog's brain, but the blood in each spleen comes from the other dog. So uh, I'll focus on the donor dog on the left, on the recipient dog uh, on the right. And um, <clears throat> if you inject an irritant into the recipient dog's spleen, of course, it goes into the, that, that dog's spleen, and then that information goes to that dog's brain, and uh, that dog expresses discomfort. Um, hopefully, that's clear. So the irritant is working in the uh, recipient dog's spleen. Okay. If you give the donor dog morphine, an opiate, not over the counter, it will uh, go to that dog's brain and the rest of the body. Uh, but through the uh, cross perfusion, it will go to the other dog's uh, spleen. And then we inject irritant into the recipient dog's spleen. And that spleen is getting morphine from the first dog. Uh, and the second dog responds, uh, suggesting that uh, morphine is not inhibiting pain in the organ. It's inhibiting pain somewhere else. Uh, if you give the recipient dog aspirin, uh, a, a drug I like quite a bit, uh, it will go into that dog's brain and uh, everything except the spleen, it'll end up in the donor dog's spleen. And we give an irritant into the recipient dog and the recipient dog feels pain, uh, suggesting that uh, aspirin everywhere in that dog's body, including its brain, is not helping it. Uh, the pain is still there. Now we give the recipient dog morphine. And now the morphine is gonna go everywhere in that dog except the spleen. Uh, it will go to its brain. Um, and then we put an irritant into that dog. 
and the dog is happy, uh, suggesting that morphine, uh, which was one of my focuses in my early career, uh, is working in the, in the, the brain's central nervous system, uh, not in the target organ. If you give the donor dog aspirin, which means it goes to that dog's brain and body, but the other dog's spleen, and then we put an irritant into the recipient dog's spleen, and that dog is happy, suggesting that aspirin is not working in the central nervous system, it's working in the target organ. That made me very happy. I, I was totally comfortable with that because I'm a, I'm a psychologist and we used to think we owned the brain and biology owned everything else. Um, this used to play in the science center and I'm not going to play it and you don't have to watch it. Uh, but it talks about how do pain relievers work. And the book talks about uh, COX inhibitors and that's part of this discussion, this video. Uh, don't watch it. Uh, it's not, it's not, not true. It is true. It's just uh, not overly relevant. And the, the book does a medium good job of uh, dealing with pain relievers. And by the way, in this uh, video, they only deal with aspirin and uh, ibuprofen. They do not do Tylenol. So I was in psychology. I wanted brain stuff. I wanted pain inhibition. Uh, I used to stimulate the brain to produce pain inhibition. Uh, and we called it stimulation produced analgesia or SPA. So I put electrodes into uh, rats uh, midbrains. And uh, all right, you can't understand how SPA works without knowing uh, that is uh, dimly uh, understanding, which is all you guys have to do, how pain is organized within the central nervous system or within the nervous system. Uh, pain, a constellation of behaviors, which means it's not one thing, it's many things, organized at multiple levels of the nervous system. It's complex. Uh, say it over and over and over and over. And that's what's true, constellation of behaviors organized at multiple levels of the nervous system. Uh, I'm a published photographer. These are some of my uh, photographs of the sheep brain. And uh, there's research I didn't do, uh, increasing shock intensities, uh, triggering different pain behaviors uh, in rats, but I had these sheep brains, constellation of behaviors. So with, uh, relatively low shock, animal flinches and jumps, more shock, they run, <clears throat> more shock, they vocalize while the shock is being presented, more shock, they begin, they continue to vocalize after uh, the shock is terminated, and with the highest level, uh, they try to attack the source of the pain. And those are organized at different levels of the nervous system. Flinch, jump, spinal cord, running lower brainstem, vocalizing during uh, midbrain, PHE, maybe related to Tourette's. That's an aside, not relevant to the lecture. Uh, after thalamus, limbic system, and attack uh, limbic frontal cortex. So constellation behaviors organized at multiple levels of the nervous system. Oh, and I'm showing you first arrow spinal cord, lower brain stem, uh, midbrain, uh, thalamus, and uh, limbic frontal cortex. And you certainly don't have to look, learn about this, but substance P is important. And there is a sensory neuron. Uh, substance P is, is relevant. Uh, you would expect the substance to be made in the cell body would go to the terminal so it can talk to the next cell, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, you would expect it to go uh, into the central nervous system, but it also, whoops, 
it also is shipped uh, to the skin. Uh, why? Now, if we were doing this live, I would crush my skin for you. Uh, I, I would take out forceps, I would crush my skin, and a cavalcade of events would occur that causes a, uh, a red blotch on my skin. Uh, and uh, that in part is substance P coming out of your sens sensory neurons. Uh, and it can be important to increase pain sensitivity after injury. And oh my God, look at that picture. Uh, that's the spinal cord. It's beyond comprehension in terms of complexity. I just want you to be amazed. Um, look at the pathways. They are almost beyond comprehension. I just want you to be amazed. Um, and there it is going up uh, through the brain. And one of the places it goes to is my old friend, the periaqueductal gray. And we'll see a little bit more of that later. Uh, yes, notice the PAG. And uh, neurosurgeons used to try to cut brain, uh, pain out. This is a classic figure from a classic book. Uh, all those black spots are where neurosurgeons have tried to uh, block pain. And most of them don't work. Uh, what about pain inhibition? Uh, opiates are probably the most reliable analgesic, uh, analgesics available, and I prefer opiates to opioids. Uh, moderate to severe pain and suffering, how do they work? Up until the latter part of the last century, uh, we didn't have a clue until some of the stuff that I was related, uh, I'm related to. So there's a cross section of the brain on the left. There's a hole in the middle, that's the cerebral aqueduct. And the gray around it is the peri, which means around aqueductal gray. And uh, there's a figure you've already seen. You can see the hole here, and the PHE is around it. And um, there is a rat being tested uh, for the tail flick response. Uh, the tail flick response does not involve the brain. You only need the spinal cord, and yet the brain can inhibit that pain. Uh, inhibiting the tail flick means there must be a descending brain to spinal cord pain inhibitory system. The tail flick is totally spinally mediated, no brain. Disconnect the brain, and it still happens. Uh, if electrical stimulation of the bread brain can inhibit this reflex, it probably means that some system exists between the midbrain and spinal cord that can stop pain at a very, very early point of processing the pain, actually in the spinal cord. And the plot thickens. Huda Akil, uh, who was in the lab, I eventually joined, uh, and uh, she became president of the uh, American Pain Association. Uh, she took every drug off the shelf and tried to block SP, SPA. She did brain stimulation. She produced SPA in the tail flick and tried to block it to find out what was happening. One of the drugs is relatively new. Now it's not. It's uh, uh, naloxone. And uh, this is very important for treating opiate uh, overdoses. It works really, really well. Uh, naloxone could block analgesia from SPA produced by stimulation of the PAG. Since it couldn't be blocking electricity, this suggested that brain stimulation could release, release endogenous chemicals that interacted with opiate receptors. Opioid mania, mania. you can't imagine how crazy everybody went for this. Uh, with the discovery of opiate receptors and their endogenous lycans in that order, the pieces began to fall into place. Receptors were in many brain and spinal cord locations that were already thought to be important uh, for pain transmission. So they were the right locations to play roles in uh, pain inhibition. Uh, was it opioid? By the way, I use the word opioid for endogenous, what's natural. Three standard tests. Uh, could it be blocked by naloxone or other antagonists? 
Uh, does it show tolerance, reduced effect with repeated administration? Does it show cross tolerance with other opiates or opioids? Opioids are endogenous, opioid, opiates are drugs. Uh, there's a map of opiate receptors and the PAG has plenty. The PAG, however, has almost no direct connections to the spinal cord. There must be a relay between the PAG and the cord. And here's a picture of that. So there's the PAG, which talks to the nucleus rifa magnus, which then talks to the spinal cord. And uh, that's one pathway for inhibiting pain uh, that seems to be uh, opioid related and therefore opiate related. Uh, life was simple. The brain had an opioid mediated descending brain to spinal cord pain inhibitory system. But to believe the simple story, you had to ignore the fact that some labs couldn't replicate the effect of naloxone on SPA, and that's sort of where I came in. I noticed that in Huda's work, some drugs, uh, with some drugs, she got different results when she was in or near a certain nucleus in the PAG. So uh, I, we implanted stimulating electrodes along the midline it scattered above, above and below uh, that nucleus. So here we go. This whole area is the PAG, but the dorsal rafe is this area down here. Uh, rafe is an area that's associated with serotonin. And so we have all those electrodes, and we gave naloxone at different doses. And you can see that naloxone worked pretty well if the uh, electrodes were in the dorsal uh, rafe or below but did basically nothing above the dorsal rafe. So there seemed to be two systems. Uh, so we had dorsal above the dorsal rafe, annoyingly, I know, and then ventral, which includes the dorsal rafe, annoying, I know. Uh, dorsal, not blocked by naloxone, no tolerance, no cross tolerance with opiates uh, or opioids, uh, ventral, Blocked by naloxone, tolerance, cross tolerance with opiates or opioids. So the ventral uh, is what opioid mania was about. I was obsessed with dorsal, but nobody cared. Uh, how do they get to the spinal cord? Well, there's that nucleus rafe magnus thing. Uh, lesions of that, destruction of that disrupt uh, ventral opioid, but not dorsal. And this is other research I did. The gray area is the destroyed area. And as you destroy more and more of that area, uh, the refi magnus, uh, the SPA from the midbrain works less and less well. Uh, you need more and more electricity to get analgesia. Uh, so, but these lesions didn't do anything. Uh, to analgesia from the from the dorsal area, so the uh, don't worry about that spawn in fields. Uh, non opioid goes more laterally. It has it still goes to the spinal cord, but it has an independent pathway. Opioid versus non opioid. Non opioid is we didn't know, uh, and I couldn't get UCLA to start looking at it. Lots of time, lots and lots of time, 14 years. Uh, the federal government was and is uh, an impediment uh, because they treated marijuana as a schedule one drug, a term you should be familiar with. Um, and this is an article published by a friend of mine, J. Michael Walker. Uh, pain modulation by release of endogenous cannabinoid and andamide. So uh, you can see SPA and the PAG. And uh, he found, his lab found, um, that uh, the non-opioid SPA uh, is endocannabinoid uh, 14 years later. Uh, anandamide, remember that. And where is that? Uh, they, uh, if you block 
uh, endocannabinoids, you block pain inhibition from the dorsal uh, PAG. Uh, they're in lots of places. Uh, caught a putamen involved in uh, Parkinson's and the cortex and the cerebellum. They're just everywhere. And um, we, could, we, we didn't know that when I was doing my stuff uh, with dorsal and ventral. In the brain, uh, there is an opioid system that can block pain at the spinal level. There is an endocannabinoid system that can block pain at the spinal level. But opiates uh, have uh, been long known to block suffering, a brain action, and endocannabinoids uh, can do that too. Uh, how do they work? We already saw a video, no you didn't because I told you not to watch it, uh, about ibuprofen and aspirin, but it didn't deal with Tylenol. Tylenol is an old drug, it's been around for about 100 years. And the field uh, was and is still a bit vague about how it works, uh, but certainly convinced of its safety until recently. Dum, dum, dum. So there I am in happier days, sitting outside the library. Uh, that was a photographer from the Scranton Times. He does nice work. So there I am in the uh, idyllic summer of 2013. And I'm reading and I'm reading. That's what I do. And uh, I was dimly aware that Tylenol, that is acetaminophen, that, that is paracetamol, which I don't think your book mentions, but Europeans like that term, probably works in the brain and not the periphery. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, more on this classic pain. So acetaminophen reduces social pain, behavioral and neural evidence. And uh, Baumeister, who I hope I circle, there he is, he spoke at the University of Scranton. And he did research uh, college students in Florida, and he gave them Tylenol, acetaminophen, and had them go about their daily business, and th then fill out surveys about, how was your day? Did you get upset? And uh, they were less upset by daily mishaps. They were more chill. <laughs> Dude. Uh, and uh, that made me interested more in, in acetaminophen, acetaminophen, Tylenol, also known as paracetamol in Europe. Uh, and I'm on Wikipedia, looking at paracetamol, things you can learn. So there's uh, paracetamol, that's a very simple molecule, didn't excite me very much. But that is a metabolite. That is your body takes the molecule on the left and turns it into the molecule on the right. And I said, dude, that's a very familiar molecule. Uh, and it looks a lot like an andamine, an endogenous uh, or an uh, endocannabinoid. They're not the same, but boy, structurally, they are in the ballpark. So I'm sitting out there. And uh, Dr. Foley comes by, and I walk him through this. He's a biochemist, and he was intrigued. And as a biochemist, he went in and asked the question, how does the body do that? And uh, before my battery dies at the table the next day, he gave me uh, data how paracetamol turns something that is structurally related, something uh, turns into something structurally related to an andamine. Now, I, I didn't emphasize this name before, but Bassbaum is in there. So he found the pathway, or a pathway. It looks as if this metabolite is at best a weak endocannabinoid receptor agonist. It's more of a reuptake inhibitor, which should from this chapter uh, and others remind you of Prozac, uh, SSRI for serotonin. Um, and 
direct receptor agonist would knock you into next week. Uh, we wouldn't be smoking marijuana, we'd be taking Tylenol. Uh, re reuptake inhibitors are kinder and gentler. They enhance your own voice. And uh, yeah, there's a little joke. So I'd probably take Tylenol for happy hour. Paracetamol, again, which is what they call it in Europe, which is Tylenol, which is a set of medicine, get ready, is the most common pain reliever given to children, and it's widely used during pregnancy. Uh, more than half of US to to toddlers have taken it. It's the standard pain reliever and now used for circumcisions. Is it a good idea to expose developing brains pre or postnatally to a drug that affects a very per pervasive neurotransmitter system in the brain. I suppose that it was not, and I spent a great deal of time during that summer and fall trying to figure out how to be the first to show that Tylenol was a bad idea. Dr. Orr helped, but I failed, not because Tylenol is a good idea, but because science marches on and others collected data. Uh, and the data are in, and my function now is to spread the word. There is compelling research using really well monitored uh, Norwegian and Danish healthcare systems. They're, they, are, they are very impressive. And here we go, prenatal paracetamol, remember that's Tylenol, exposure and child neurodevelopment, calling a sibling controlled cohort study. We won't go into what that means but uh, it's hard to do. Look at the number of wild live births up there, 48,631. Uh, Long-term exposure to paracetamol during pregnancy was associated with adverse psychomotor, comma, behavioral, which should be a comma, and temperamental outcomes at three years of age, three years of age, after adjusting for familial, uh, familial and genetic confounding. Prenatal exposure to ibuprofen was not associated with uh, adverse neurodevelopmental uh, outcomes. If replicated, here comes the lawyers, these uh, findings may suggest limiting long-term use of paracetamol, which is Tylenol, which is acetaminophen uh, during pregnancy. Yeah. So then we have this one, 64,322 live births. See the menifin, which is Tylenol, uh, during pregnancy, behavioral problems, and hyperkinetic disorders. Uh, high risk of receiving a hospital diagnosis of hyperkinetic disorder, having ADHD uh, like behaviors at age seven. Uh, results do not appear to be confounded by maternal inflammation, uh, infection during pregnancy, the mother's mental health problems or other potential compounds that we evaluated. Uh, maternal acetaminophen used during pregnancy is associated with higher risks for hyperkinetic disorder and ADHD, ADHD uh, behaviors in children. Uh, because the exposure and outcome are frequent, these uh, results are of public health relevance, but lawyers, further investigations are needed. Uh, there's some rodent data that we don't need to deal with, uh, but it affects, it affects rodents too. And mice, we don't worry about this. Humans are more important. But, you know, locomotor, spatial learning, uh, reduced analgesic effects as adults, should we be concerned? Uh, in humans, very recent comp compelling evidence suggests Developmental problems following prenatal exposure, possible ADHD, delayed motor development, socialization issues, impulse control, and there's rodents, uh, motor activity, cognitive ability, analgesic and anxiolytic responses. Uh, there's some evidence for increase in asthma, uh, undescended testicles. Uh, some research indicates there should be concern about autism, but that's a stretch. Uh, I worry, it's my nature. Uh, and
and thank you to these people who helped me uh, make the, uh, the slide proceed no further. Okay, I will stop.